Today we'll talk about this specific issue. Uh, since this summer, uh, the data transfer mechanism known as privacy shield uh, is no longer in use between the US and EU. And we will talk a bit about what that means with regard to GDPR um, for businesses that want to do business, uh, for US businesses that want to do business in Europe uh, and vice versa. Uh, and go into how Kubernetes uh, and cloud native technology can be an enabler for solving for GDPR. This is the agenda. Um, with a short intro, I'll talk uh, a bit about what uh, GDPR means, uh, what the Fall of Privacy Shield uh, means in terms of implications. And then I'll turn over to Christian. Uh, he'll go into a bit about uh, the practical uh, nitty gritty details about how to actually uh, solve for GDPR using cloud native tooling. Uh, and then at the end, we have time for uh, QA. My name is Rob Winter, the CEO of Productive. Uh, with me today, I have Christian Klein and also Johan Torchon. Uh, both Christian and uh, Johan have a research background in the cloud computing. Christian uh, is a, a senior cloud native architect at Elastis and does a lot of both these kind of talks, uh, talks at international conferences, but also helps customers all over the world pretty much with compliance and security related aspects and also uh, develop our uh, compliant Kubernetes uh, distribution, which is a CNCF certified distribution targeted at uh, in, uh, compliant, uh, um, compliant industries like fintech, great tech, um, medtech and so on. Short intro, GDPR, Privacy Shield. Um, I guess this, we, have, we have both an European and an American audience today. I guess this subject is mostly familiar to Europeans, but it affects uh, US companies as well. So what is GDPR? Um, it's a European law. So it's written in, uh, in law in all the European countries. Uh, this means it's at the same level as, uh, it's considered a human right in, in Europe. So it's at the same level as getting food on the table and uh, kind of those kind of topics. So it's very high on the agenda in, in Europe. Um, it addresses transfer of personal data, which means that it has implications for how we do business in the, the kind of cloud related industries uh, outside the EU and outside the EEA area, uh, which is uh, uh, the, the countries that are not blue in this picture. Um, <clears throat> so what is personal data then? This is a relevant question. According to GDPR, personal data has a pretty broad definition, meaning that uh, pretty much anything that touches uh, on a kind of a person or um, can be used to identify a uh, human being is considered personal data. Uh, some examples are names, of course, uh, personal identification numbers, anything about location, biometrics, or online identifiers, such as your IP address. Uh, but it also has a pretty wide range of um, other identifiable factors that um, indirectly can help identify a specific human being. Uh, and this is very important because this means that if you're not a machine-to-machine -machine business, if you somehow deal with humans, which most uh, organizations does, um, you very, very likely uh, handle personal uh, data. So to know if GDPR applies to you, uh, first uh, check if you serve EU, EU customers. Um, if you're an international business, you probably do. Uh, and second, uh, have a look at what, you, kind of what your application actually does. Uh, most likely you process personal data in some manner. Um, if humans are in the loop somehow, uh, you're probably touching uh, personal data. Uh, if you have some kind of sign up to your service, if you're a SaaS company, uh, for example, if you have any kind of customer register, uh, you're handling personal data. Um, if you handle any kind of indirect identifiable information, uh, like uh, track people's um, location or store chat logs in Elasticsearch or pretty much anything that can be used to, to backtrack and identify um, people, then you're also considering uh, consider handling personal data. Uh, and a lot of stuff like email addresses, for example, if you store a single email address and that email address uh, has the format of robert.winter at elastis.com, that is also personal identifiable information because that can be used to, uh, to identify me. So uh, it's, a, it's a pretty broad scope. 
Um, and GDPR has a few terms and requirements that I quickly want to touch upon just to give a feeling for what this actually means for, uh, for businesses. Uh, GDPR has three terms. Uh, GDPR talks about data controller. This is the <coughs> entity that um, that owns the processing of the data. This can be a hostel, this can be an organization which brings in the actual users and are responsible for the management of the personal data. Um, data controllers in turn use data processors <coughs> to, to manage and process uh, this data in any, in, a, in any way or form. I think the simplest example would be kind of a cloud provider uh, where you run your applications and store your data. That is a typical data processor. Uh, and a data subject is uh, an individual uh, in the system. Some examples of the requirements then that the GDPR poses on you. Um, the GDPR is very strict on that you shouldn't keep data only the necessary. Um, it's also very strict that you should do everything in your power to prevent kind of the loss or unauthorized access to any kind of personal data. Uh, users um, should have the right to be forgotten, uh, which is much simpler said than done. Um, GDPR also wants you to build data protection in your application by design and by default. So by default, your systems should uh, be secure for your data. Uh, you're also obliged to keep records of all kind of processing activities, uh, i.e. log. Logs are very important in GDPR. Uh, and you're also obliged to notify uh, both supervisor authorities and the data subjects whenever a personal data breach has occurred. And you need to do this uh, very quickly. So it puts, GDPR puts a lot of strain and a lot of requirements on how you actually both build your applications and how you kind of manage your processes around it. How is this enforced then? Um, how can people make you uh, live up to GDPR? Um, <clears throat> there are something called data protection authorities or DPAs uh, in each uh, country that follow GDPR or similar rules. Um, these guys and girls are responsible for um, keeping track and finding companies that doesn't follow GDPR. And the fines can be either 4% of um, the turnover of your turnover for a company or 20 million uh, euros, <clears throat> whichever is greater. Uh, we had a recent fine. Um, just a couple of days ago. H&M was fined in Germany for the slight sum of $41 million. Uh, but that pales a bit to kind of the top three fines. Um, uh, I think most of you guys probably have heard of this. British, British Airways uh, was fined by uh, the UK regulator. Marriott, uh, this is a US company, was fined by also the UK regulator. Uh, and Google was fined. Um, pretty recently as well. Um, the topic of privacy is also considered an international trend and many countries have adopted similar laws um, inspired or one-to-one -one, um, with the EAPR. Uh, for you guys in the US, uh, CCP is a thing that is in effect uh, from this year, uh, which is very similar to GDPR. Um, it's implemented on state level, so in California, not on the federal level. Uh, but I think the trend is very clear in other countries like um, um, like Japan or Canada have similar kind of laws in place since a couple of years. <coughs> uh, good to know uh, when we get into talking about the privacy shield is that uh, EU has a list uh, of countries that they um, consider to have adequate uh, GDP or level of protection and which are kind of okay countries for any EU organization to send uh, data to without any kind of privacy regime like uh, data transfer agreement. And those are basically the countries in this list, Andorra, Argentina, uh, some of the kind of closer countries to Europe, but also uh, uh, some further away companies, uh, countries like Uruguay, for example, also have kind of similar uh, data privacy rules as the Europe. So getting into privacy shield then, um, what has happened exactly? Uh, privacy shield before the summer, that was a data transfer framework implemented to allow um, EU companies to make uh, data transfers to US companies um, 
with the same level of protection as the previous countries uh, listed on the, on the last slide. Um, this is really good and it allowed kind of simple, uh, simple flow of data between the EU and the US. Um, this summer, uh, the EU Court of Justice invalidated Privacy Shield. And that is the picture on the right where this guy, Max Schrems, who has been driving uh, this case, this case and similar since before 2015. Uh, is very happy that you know, <coughs> uh, this Paris Shield Agreement was finally uh, 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 brought down. Uh, what the EU Court of Justice found was basically two things, that um, uh, the FISA um, law that the US has and the Executive Order 12333 uh, doesn't provide enough protection for EU citizens' personal data. So this is kind of the overarching problem uh, that um, the U.S. has um, quite strict surveillance laws, uh, while the um, EU has quite strict uh, privacy rules, uh, and they don't really uh, match up in a good way. And um, uh, Max Krems, who is an Austrian uh, privacy activist, uh, um, was onto this already back in 2015 when he uh, filed the original Krems 1 complaint. Um, there was something similar in place back then, a data transfer mechanism called Safe Harbor. Um, Max didn't like that, so he brought it to court and they had to tear it down. Uh, soon after that, uh, they put in place Privacy Shield, which was pretty much Safe Harbor all over again, but with a few twists and turns. Uh, Max uh, quickly turned around and also um, challenged Facebook's use of something called standard contractual clauses, which is basically a, a contract between companies. Um, where uh, Facebook in this, um, uh, in this instance uh, promises to handle uh, personal data in a manner that is equivalent to uh, how it will be handled in the EU, pretty much. Um, this is a Schrems 2 case, uh, and this ended up this summer with uh, the EU Court of Justice uh, bringing down Private Shield and uh, invalidated that as a transfer mechanism. Uh, so, in the basics of this, I mean, it's a, it's two different cultures. Um, in the US, uh, <clears throat> the government uh, believes that it needs access to personal information to protect its citizens. Uh, EU uh, countries believe that it's a human right, basically, to decide over your own uh, personal data. Uh, so it's, these two um, views uh, are in uh, very clear opposition. And uh, judging by the kind of current uh, US political debates at the moment, this would probably kind of not change anything soon. So for companies doing business, uh, both in the US and in the EU, uh, this is something uh, we need probably need to take into consideration for a long time going forward. Why is this important then? So basically, under GDPR, which affects uh, pretty much all of us, as a data controller, you're responsible for your data processors, no matter where, where they are. Uh, so any kind of service you run, ranging from uh, IS to PaaS to SaaS, um, you are responsible for uh, the compliance level of that service. So no matter if you're running virtual machines at top AWS, or if, you, or if you're buying an Office 365 subscription, or uh, using any other service, uh, you as a data controller are responsible uh, for how personal data is managed uh, if you send it away. Um, and uh, the big thing here is, of course, is that the US pretty much has a monopoly on modern uh, hyperscaler cloud services. Over two thirds of public cloud workloads uh, run in US data centers. And the big thing here is that uh, it's the legal jurisdiction that matters, so not so much where the data centers are actually located. Uh, of course, the big hyperscalers have data centers all over the world, uh, but the actual location where uh, your data is stored doesn't matter. Uh, it's where the administrators that have access to data, uh, where they live. Um, so if you're handling EU citizens' data, you're using illegal services. Um, this summer, over 5,000 services have been relying on Privacy Shield as a mechanism to transfer data. Um, there's a long list of companies that have signed up and uh, adhere to Privacy Shield. If you're using those, uh, those services, 
uh, and relying on private shield, that's currently illegal um, according to EU Court of Justice. What are the implications of this then? Basically that most companies in the world are currently in somehow or some way using legal services according to uh, GDPR. Uh, there's been a few um, surveys or kind of there's been a few surveys kind of looking into how people are actually responding to this and overall I think the picture to the right is pretty telling uh, there's a lot of uncertainty so a lot of people have no idea how they, how they will go forward um, and there's also a lot of status quo uh, there's a ton of work involved actually moving workloads and switching providers so uh, until further notice, a lot of organizations, especially those that doesn't really um, worry a lot of, uh, about compliance on a day-to-day -day basis, they are just sitting tight and kind of holding on. Uh, no YB, uh, which is Max Schrems organization, did a pretty complete survey with a lot of the big US uh, service providers like Facebook and IWS and uh, Salesforce and all the big ones. And, the takeaway was that pretty much none of them could say how they actually will go about um, handling uh, the fall of privacy shield and the EU uh, ruling. And so kind of from all sides, both from the end user side and from the vendor side, there's a ton of uncertainty and um, it's still very early days. These are extremely long processes and you know, it's, still, um, it's still up in the air and uh, under a lot of discussion what this actually means and how um, how, how the courts will go about uh, handling this situation. <clears throat> I think the big takeaway here is that if you are an organization with a kind of mature approach to compliance, where compliance is important to you, uh, you need to do kind of your risk analysis and think about what data do you process and in what way should you handle it. I think that is the big takeaway. Um, the question is basically, will you somehow be held accountable uh, for not following GDPR? Uh, and depending on uh, depending on what the industry you're in, uh, I would say that this is very unlikely at the moment. Um, if you want to comply with GDPR though, kind of what are your options? How can you go about it? Uh, we'll talk about one option later on, which we uh, consider being Kubernetes and cloud native uh, software, but there are also other ways. Uh, the first option that you usually hear a lot about are standard contractual clauses or binding corporate rules. Um, these are basically company to company uh, agreements uh, where you can kind of set up an agreement with any of the big cloud providers or any of the service providers you use in the US, and uh, they promise you that they will manage your personal data uh, on an adequate level. Uh, and uh, the thing is, um, the EU Court of Justice didn't shoot down. Uh, SCCs as a mechanism uh, during the ruling this summer, so they are still valid. You can still have contracts, of course, with uh, any company you want. Uh, the thing is, uh, the pretty long text uh, to write, uh, it puts a, the EU Court of Justice put a ton of uh, responsibility on you as a data owner to actually make sure that if you rely on standard contractual clauses, that you put the correct supplementary measures in place. Uh, and what these supplementary measures would be, <coughs> uh, that is uh, still a bit up in the air and uh, uh, it's not very clearly defined. Uh, the thing is, you, to use this, you would have to ensure that uh, US laws, uh, like uh, FISA or the Cloud Act, does not impinge on the number, level of protection uh, that are required uh, from GDPR. So, uh, it goes a bit without saying that if you have a contract with a company and the, the government comes knocking on the door, uh, I don't think that the contract is worth a lot. Um, but one way of going about it, uh, one very popular supplementary measure is to encrypt um, personal data that you handle. Uh, and this is uh, of course very good. Um, you can either encrypt data in transit, you can encrypt it at rest, uh, or you can try to encrypt it in use, um, which um, is pretty hard. Uh, the thing with this is that you would have to, uh, a lot of the cloud providers uh, say that they kind of allow you to encrypt your data, uh, so it's fine with GDPR. Uh, 
but the thing here is that you will it's your responsibility to make sure that data is actually encrypted all the time so kind of all the way from uh, being transferred over the internet to kind of being stored uh, in memory or at disk uh, to being processed um, when uh, users actually run your application and uh, this is not extremely easy or uh, potentially even doable in most cases uh, another way which uh, Facebook and others have started doing is to try to get explicit consent from your data subjects, i.e. the users of your services. Um, this is a bit tricky because it, uh, according to GDPR, you can get uh, consent from uh, data subjects to transfer data, and that can make it okay, but it requires very specific writing and it has to be kind of, uh, the consent has to be very specific. Um, so this is still not tried in court how kind of how you can actually go about and uh, get consent from users in a good way. Uh, another way, of course, is to minimize uh, the amount of personal data that you actually uh, that you actually store. So you can remove as much personal data as uh, as you potentially can. Uh, you can anon anonymize personal data, or you can pseudo anonymize uh, personal data. The difference being with when you can pseudo anonymize data you can always get the original data back so you can always get the personal data back uh, using kind of mapping table or, or keys uh, while you, when you anonymize it it's anonymized you can never get the original data back uh, and all, all this <coughs> just to be clear if you would actually get audited or kind of um, have someone come and look at your GDPR compliance of course doing all this stuff is of course good so kind of it reflects uh, very well on you but it doesn't uh, necessarily make you fully GDPR compliant uh, doing uh, any of this. Uh, and the fifth thing, which kind of uh, we consider might be the kind of the easiest technical solution is to use uh, EU providers uh, for uh, running your EU uh, related workloads and storing your EU personal data. Uh, and this is where um, cloud agnostic uh, solutions like uh, Kubernetes and other cloud native tooling comes into play. We'll talk a bit about this, <clears throat> then I'll hand over to Christian. Basically, if you're looking into EU cloud providers and you're looking to run some kind of multi-cloud setup using the big American hyperscalers and combining that with EU providers, uh, there are quite a few, but compared to the big American providers, uh, the EU providers are <coughs> spread all over the place. And besides OVH, uh, which is a big player, most of uh, the European cloud providers are kind of semi-small and have a, uh, <clears throat> historically, EU providers have mostly uh, been providing IS services, um, but recently there's been a lot of interest in the, the question of data privacy and the whole data sovereignty uh, of Europe. So a lot of the big European companies like Germany and France uh, feel that it's time, uh, this is a great time for Europe to step up and also um, provide their own kind of IT infrastructure services. Uh, which you can argue is hugely important in today's modern society. So there's been a renewed focus on, on this topic and a lot of these uh, uh, European cloud providers are really kind of pushing ahead and trying to at least get up to par um, with the um, American hyperscalers. Uh, we, we work with most of these providing our services, so we know them quite well. Um, but in general, you can say, I mean, AWS has a ton of services uh, and the, the service catalog of a European uh, cloud provider uh, kind of can't compete in terms of number of services. But uh, if you're looking to, to run workloads in, in the EU, at least you get kind of <coughs> the most important services are available at most cloud providers. That was the overview. Now I'll turn over to Christian to talk about how you can actually go about using Kubernetes and cloud native tooling um, to build this foundation and to uh, comply with GDPR basically. Yes, so thank you, Robert. Hello, everyone. Um, like Robert introduced me, so I'm senior cloud architect at Elasticis and I'm kind of at the intersection between InfoSec and compliance and how to make the best use of cloud technologies and cloud native technologies to solve these issues. So let me start by saying that whenever you're talking about GDPR or compliance, this is really happening at several levels. 
you are kind of responsible for making sure that compliance is happening at all of the layers of the hardware and the software stack. So if you're looking at the lowest possible level, the hardware um, topics that, or controls better said, that are dealing with such issues are things like physical security. Do you actually know who gets into your data center and who can touch your computers and who can steal potential hard drives, personally identifiable information out of your data center? And of course, infrastructure as a service security. So making sure that somebody cannot just SSH into the host and then steal data out of the VMs that are running there. Now, fortunately, um, Europe is pretty mature on this particular topic. So all of the vendors that um, Robert has previously shown, they are very serious about security at this particular level. And most of them have also some ISO 27K certification. And when I say ISO, 27001 certification. Um, I kind of need to remember a story from a horror story from a friend that basically said that, yeah, he, he had some platform in emerging market and they claimed to be ISO 27K compliant. But then when he actually went down, he noticed that they had a server hole that was kept, let's say, less secure than I would typically keep my computers in my own cellar. Anyway, what I want to say that this is really not a level that you need to worry about if you're going to Europe. Then of course you have the platform level, and here you have various controls that you need about to deal with, such as monitoring, intrusion detection, logging, uh, keeping your operating system patched, and so on. And then on the highest level, you have the application and company level, and um, it is pretty easy to think that, well, this is where most of your efforts should be going, right? Because it's the application, for example, that in the end takes all the private personal identifiable information, and of course, it's your staff that should be informed not to download all your personal information and leave on a USB stick from the premises. However, in this presentation, we'll be talking mostly about the platform level. And um, I just want to say that compliance and GDPR bring some, let's say, subtle implications at this platform that we really want to make you aware of. So let me start uh, by, on the next slide, uh, let us reiterate the cloud native definition. So let me read it aloud. Cloud native technologies empower organizations to build and run scalable applications in modern dynamic environments, such as public, private, and hybrid cloud. These technologies enable loosely coupled systems that are resilient, manageable, and observable. Combined with robust automation, they allow engineers to make high impact changes frequently and predictably with minimum toil. So I have highlighted the words that at least to me are the most important in this particular context, public, private, and hybrid clouds. So although we tend to think about Kubernetes as being this managed service that is running on top of one of the hyperscaler, cloud native technologies are actually very much intended and usable on any kind of cloud, including the European ones. So then if we're looking on the next slide on the cloud native uh, foundation landscape, the CNCF, so um, the one that came actually with this particular definition, is organizing projects in plenty of categories, such as database, streaming and messages, and remote procedure call, and so on. So they're kind of, it kind of feels like there is an answer to any kind of service that you would need in order to satisfy your, your application requirements, even if you do not have these as managed services. So let me just give you some, uh, some example of such services. Um, on the next slide, we have uh, highlight. Um, yeah, so what I, what I really want to say here is that this cloud native technologies should really allow you some cloud agnostic compliance. So this means that basically you can use cloud native and Kubernetes as some building blocks so that you can run your application workloads seamlessly under both European jurisdiction, so as to keep personal data more protected, but also, of course, American jurisdictions, because that's probably where your customers are. And by embracing cloud native technologies and Kubernetes, you're avoiding vendor lock-in. And like I previously said, this really enables you to handle European personal identifiable information under EU jurisdiction. Let us get a bit more uh, concrete on how you achieve this cloud native uh, agnostics. So I ha we have taken here some AWS services and um, let me just say that AWS is a really great cloud provider out there. I have worked with it in many projects and it's absolutely great. So praise to that team. Um, 
However, in this particular context, there is a big problem with AWS, which is that it's a US-based company, and that depending on how exactly the Privacy Shield um, discussion will unfold, you might get in trouble with using their services. Now, for the positive part, however, most of the AWS services have some kind of cloud-native alternative. So if, for example, you're using a message queue such as a simple queuing service, then there is NATS as a cloud native computing project that, uh, that allows to do that. If you need something like object storage or block storage, so the equivalent of S3 or EDS, you have Rook, which is a pretty mature project and that allows you to deal with that. Um, container registry, Harbor. If you need um, a highly available relational database, so which is automatically replicated across multiple availability zones. Vites offers a solution to that. Uh, PyTV, key, key value stores. And I'm not sure it makes sense to go through all of these services one by one, but let's just say that the options seem to be there. It's just perhaps a little bit more configuration hassle, but there are ways of making uh, your application run smoothly without too much overhead and still embracing cloud agnostic compliance. Okay, so just because you're using cloud native projects doesn't necessarily mean that you're automatically GDPR compliant. So let me spend a little bit more time. Um, I cannot really give you all the details, but let's just go a little bit to some of the more technical GDPR articles and show you what exactly are the implications on um, how you're using cloud native technologies. So we have here selected, let's say the GDPR articles that we felt most important with respect to their technical implementation at the platform level. And like I said, we cannot go through all of them, but let us just focus on the ones that are being shown here in bold. So if we take the first one, um, yeah, you need to, these articles basically point down to the classical questions of controls. If you're familiar with ISO 27K or another compliance framework, you really need to make sure that um, you're using these projects in a way that you develop also these kind of capabilities. So capabilities such as access control, such as technical vulnerability management, such as network segmentation to make sure that an attacker gaining access to part of your infrastructure to one microservice cannot move laterally and infect and, um, and also take data from another microservice, intrusion detection, audit logging. You need to make sure that you have some, some backup and disaster recovery. And GDPR has a subtle implication, not only on actually doing backup and disaster recovery, but also how you're doing backup and disaster recovery. Um, yeah, and also, I'm, I'm not going to list all of these uh, controls, but for example, right to be forgotten is also a very important capability that you need to develop also at the platform level, and that has um, implication of how you're configuring your cloud native projects. Okay. So so let's talk about Article 5.1.F. Uh, by the way, if you're having trouble falling asleep and uh, you feel like you're needing a little bit of help, I totally can recommend you to print out uh, GDPR and just leave it by your bedside. If, if that doesn't help, then I really don't know what the cure could be. But anyway, if we were to disassemble a bit the legalese and look at these articles from what they mean in their pure technical interpretation, Article 5.1.F really may, means that you should try as much as possible to prevent accidental loss of data and unauthorized access of it. And now, I'm not sure how you are configuring your Kubernetes clusters. I would be very keen to uh, know more about this. But what we have seen at most of our customers is that pretty much they just take the cluster admin token and then share that among their development team or maybe their operation team, and everything is good and fine. And of course, this puts you in a little bit of a risk when it comes to GDPR, because in case the security of the cluster is compromised, say for example, by a rogue developer, or maybe just by an honest mistake, then it's very difficult to identify who exactly was responsible for that change. Also, generally using the cluster admin token or private certificate is a long lived credential, which again puts you at a risk. So therefore, one of the first thing that we would suggest you is to really protect, um, upgrade your, the authentication to your Kubernetes clusters and use something like DEX in order to allow it to tap into your identity provider of your corporation. And this is done usually via OpenID Connect or via the protocol called SAML. Um, and of course, there you would do the OAuth dance, so to speak. And that allows you to, to 
have way more and way stronger authentication. You can, for example, deploy two-factor authentication that creates a token so that you can get access to the Kubernetes cluster, but that's generally valid to, for only 12 hours. So that significantly reduces your exposure to um, unauthorized access. And then just for, for making this uh, presentation that appeals to my geeky sentiments. So if you're, for example, using kubeadmin in order to set up your Kubernetes cluster, that pretty much means that you have to worry about this line, why um, the prefix that start with OIDC, and you just need to make sure that you have a proper uh, OpenID Connect issuer. So that's generally, like I said, the DEX that you would host um, in a different Kubernetes cluster or in a different part of your infrastructure. And then, of course, you need to make sure that you're providing your uh, Kubernetes cluster with the right um, where, where to find the username claim that is then afterwards interpreted by the role-based access control infrastructure, which is built in Kubernetes, and also where exactly to find the group claims that, again, has implication on how we can do role-based access control. Uh, when it comes to accidental loss, uh, Valero seems to be the leader when it comes to backing up your Kubernetes cluster, in particular persistent volume claims and also the Kubernetes resources. But as I will show on the next slide, um, there are some implications on how you need to configure these things to make sure that they don't interfere with GDPR. So then let us head over to Article 17. This is known um, in its short form as right to erasure or right to be forgotten. So what this basically means is that whenever a data subject or simply said a user is coming knocking at your door, perhaps sending you an email, uh, they have the right to basically just claim yeah, I retract my consent, I want you to forget about me, and I want you to delete absolutely all of the data that can personally identify me and that refers to me. So that is, of course, something that I would imagine is mostly an application side decision, right? The, the deep database schema and what data is stored where, that's generally application side concern. However, it also has a little bit of implications on how you do, um, how you configure your underlying platform. So, for example, we, we just discussed Valero, and, you know, for disaster recovery purposes, there is kind of a pressure to make backups as often as possible and to keep them for as long as possible. But this, according to GDPR, is no longer okay, because you might get into trouble if, for example, somebody um, asks for their personal identifiable information to be erased, and then you're performing disaster recovery, or, for example, you're, yeah, you're restoring for backup for, for some kind of reason for example, a code change that didn't go quite well. And then suddenly the data that was requested to be erased is getting restored. And that's a complete no-no. I mean, for, for that thingy, I can imagine that you will be very quickly escalated to high levels of the courts. So then next time when you're configuring Valero, um, don't just let the default TTL be, be configured, which is currently 30 days, but try to have an honest discussion with your risk department of what should be a good value for time to live here. And, you know, in case of doubt, probably something like seven days or maybe even 24 hours might make sense. Similar implications are also happening for logging, for example. So our experience shows that it's very convenient to have uh, rather broad logging. So for example, to log database queries or to, to, to log API re, um, response and requests and especially also between the microservices at their border. And this, of course, makes perfect sense, and it's a legitimate reason to do so, because you want to be able to make sure that your system is up and running and to inspect issues that can only be detected in uh, production. However, this, again, can put you into a bit of trouble when it comes to personally identifying information, because you cannot just store um, this information forever, since personal data might make into logging information. So again, there you need to be mindful and configure, for example, Elasticsearch Curator to, uh, yeah, to delete logs after a certain time, just to make sure that personally identifiable information don't make it past their expiration date. Let us pass on to the next article. So article 25 says pretty much data protection by design and by default. Now, what exactly <laughs> the legislator has meant by this is still up for interpretation. But if one were to take the broadest possible or the strictest possible interpretation for it, that kind of suggests that you should have a proper information security 
uh, program running within your organization. You should probably have something like a chief risk officer and you, know, you should train your employees to rotate their passwords and so on. That, that at least to me kind of sounds like the spirit of this particular article, although I don't think anybody that is currently bound by GDPR actually applies to that extent. However, if you are currently, um, let's say, already applying a little bit of InfoSec and let's say want another reason to give to your chief risk officer to invest more in information security, then Article 25 can definitely give them this extra energy in organization to do so. And I have also already discussed how authentication can help you to make sure that while well, you're securing your cluster against unauthorized access. Um, we also suggest you to use some very strict pod security policies. And I have shown here a, a snippet that we typically like to recommend on the right. So we'd, for example, disable privileged containers because otherwise any kind of pod is, is pretty much capable of taking over the, the host and move laterally. We also like to drop as many capabilities as possible. And this is a very, very important remark because, for example, there was recently a CVE, a common vulnerability and exploit, that has sent all the Kubernetes admins running to upgrading the Kubernetes cluster. And uh, if, for example, you had dropped all the capabilities of your pods, then pretty much you could have just enjoyed your weekend or your beer or whenever that CVE was released, knowing that since a certain capability is required to be able to successfully exploit that CVE. So if you drop all those capabilities, you have nothing to worry about. Another thing that you might want to make sure is to allow only a whitelist set of volumes in your pods. So for example, something like host path is a complete no-no because again, that allows you to escape, um, for the pod to escape into the host VM. And of course, you want to set plenty other uh, pod security policies that furthermore restrict what your pod can do. Now, I put pod security policies in a bit of a question mark. Um, my understanding from the last KubeCon is that this is a bit of an uncertain API that hasn't really managed to move past beta. And currently people are recommending to perhaps even complete deprecate post security policies and just use something like open policy agent or some kind of generic policy agent project in order to enforce these kind of policies when um, as part of a Kubernetes admission control. So a bit like a Kubernetes API firewall that would not allow you to run any kind of pod as privilege. So we discussed also logging and then Cert Manager, of course, can help you to make, um, to make sure that you're encrypted, uh, to encrypt all your traffic via TLS over public networks. I think that nowadays, thanks to efforts such as Lens Encrypt, there is really no excuse for anybody to use plain HTTP over the public internet. Last but not least, you should also think hard about encryption at rest. So this is to, for example, mitigate the attack of somebody um, stealing hard drives and then leaving with personally identifiable information. However, I would say that do, do your homework, but mostly this is something that's already dealt with by European infrastructure as service providers. Okay, having cleared this, uh, these articles, um, I, I, I think I, I can skip this article. Um, it's just, yeah. So, as you have noticed, I hope I managed to convince you that um, just using cloud native technologies is of course a very solid uh, milestone um, roadmap in order to obtain cloud agnostic uh, compliance. However, you have to configure this in very careful ways in order to be GDPR compliant. So then I have shown you some of the nitty gritty details. Um, and of course, it would be extremely difficult for all of us to remember all of these details, and it would be a tons of effort for each and every single Kubernetes administrator to go over GDPR and to see exactly how each article applies to their cloud native stack. So in order to reduce this compliance burden, uh, we, have, we at Elasticsys have released compliant Kubernetes, which is a CNCF certified open source um, Kubernetes distribution. And its aim is pretty much to allow you to reduce your compliance burden when it comes to GDPR, but also other compliances. And the way we have architected is that in the middle, you're having your cluster with your workloads. And in these, we run a minimal number of tool sets, for example, for log forward and intrusion detection. However, all the rest, let's say the 
the most important topics for compliance are running actually in a second Kubernetes cluster where we collect logs and metrics and where all the alerts and all the detected intrusions are being stored. So this is in order to conform with uh, what is often suggested by security experts to make sure that your logging environment is tamper-proof, where tamper-proof can generally be interpreted as if an attacker managed to gain access to your production workloads, they should not be able to remove or change any logging entrants. And we have, of course, bundled plenty of projects to give um, answers to, to GDPR. So Prometheus and Grafana, of course, for gathering metrics and logs and creating alerts. Elasticsearch, FluentD, and Kibana for, for logs. And then, um, yeah, Open Policy Agent for firewalling the Kubernetes API, Falco for intrusion detection, Harbor for technical vulnerability management. So to make sure that the images you put in production are uh, lacking or without any vulnerabilities, or at least to make sure that you're becoming aware of potential vulnerabilities in production before it's too late. Now, um, on the next slide, uh, yeah, so Compliant Kubernetes is, is of course, um, you're free to download it, it's open source. And basically what it offers is a security hardened Kubernetes cluster with guardrails and, guard and best practices for compliance. Um, however, I also do understand that compliance of the platform might be a little bit of a topic that is off-putting to your uh, company, because really where your focus should be going is on the application and how exactly to, you know, not only to develop features, but also to make your applica application comply with GDPR. So in order to allow you to focus on your primary mission, uh, Elasticsearch also offers compliant Kubernetes as a managed service, and we, of course, offer enterprise-grade SLAs. And we are very happy to sign data processing agreements. So for those who are on, on familiar with what this means, it's basically a contract mandated by GDPR between our customers and a Kubernetes provider. That basically means that we are going to make sure that the platform is being managed and the personal information is going to be protected as mandated by GDPR. And we, of course, take care of everything from um, upgrading your clusters and making sure that all of the components I've just shown you are properly upgraded, so as to make sure that, well, you can focus on compliance on application level, and otherwise the data privacy is ensured during the whole application lifecycle. Yeah, we have also started to uh, build the compliant uh, cloud native stack. So often our customers are coming to us and saying like, well, Kubernetes for stateless workloads is really nice, but I somehow need to store also my data. So inside Compliant Kubernetes, we're also running, for example, MariaDB as a stateful system, which is automatically backed up and highly available. So that again, and, and of course, run in a compliant manner so that again, you can focus on your application and we deal with all of the other compliance issues. Yeah, so let me uh, finish this talk now so that you also have some time for questions and discussions. Um, the main idea that we want to present here is that GDPR really implies a strict handling of personal information. Among others, you're liable for breach reporting, for data minimization, and also for data protection. GDPR has had a very interesting development lately, SHRAMS 2, which basically creates a barrier to transferring personal information between from the US to the from the EU to the US. Fortunately, this could be also seen as a blessing for cloud native and cloud native technologies and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, because these technologies are pretty much offering building blocks for cloud nest, cloud agnostic compliance and um, and for dealing with GDPR. And of course, we have packed together best practices and subtle implications that GDPR has on how to manage these kind of projects. So therefore, we are launching the Combined Commerce open source project. And you're very welcome to check out um, the project at its .io website. With that being said, uh, thank you for your attention. Um, John, would you like to take over? Uh, sure. That's awesome talk. Uh, thank you, Robert and Christian. Uh, I think bo both awesome talks. Uh, we do have Lisa here with us, I think, for a few more moments. She 
is going to bounce out again. But uh, in terms of questions, if folks want to perhaps just drop them into the chat, um, and we can kind of take them from there, or would you guys prefer to kind of unmute folks and have them ask questions directly? I think the chat's a pretty good way to, to start um, and uh, so that we don't have to unmute everybody. Um, but, uh, and also, um, maybe I'll ask the first question. So did you already talk about, so this is open source, right? And do you, are you expecting people contributing? Did you talk about how to get involved? Um, because uh, this will be posted on the CNCF um, page when we do the, um, when we do the recording and we start posting the links and I'll post it as an ambassador and I assume people will watch it and probably want to know how to get involved. So if you can tell people that, that would be my first question. I'm not sure, do we have Johan still on the Johan line? was there. I think he just, <laughs> he just ran I just away. saw him drop. <laughs> she just left. Okay, let me, let me try to uh, tackle these questions. So we have just uh, very recently open sourced this. So let's just say that we are still at the very inception on uh, figuring out how exactly we should, we should make the best out of this project for the committee's sake. Um, we very much accept contributions. So, and of course we're very, very much looking forward to seeing your PRs and better understanding how exactly this project should evolve and what exactly are your concerns when it comes to compliant Kubernetes. That being said, um, we are currently, I mean, we, we wish this would have been a uh, CMCF project. There, I understood right now that Kubernetes distributions are not really meant to be CNCF projects. So I'm not really sure if, uh, if there's anything like a, um, how do you call it? Like, like a maturity level that you can assign to them and so on. So they don't get the same due diligence as other CNCF projects. But at any rate, we do accept contributions. And here is probably also one of our strengths because we happen to be one of the few Kubernetes distributions that are fully open source. That is cool. Yeah, we're all very much looking forward to any kind of input from uh, uh, organizations with specific regulations. Uh, we've been working with kind of the, the big ones, um, talking ISO, PCI DSS, GDPR, of course, um, and also other security standards like SOC 2 and others. Uh, but we would very much welcome input um, from other kind of more niched um, regulations and frameworks and so on, and kind of especially with regards to uh, policy creation and automatic policy control, for example with regards to, to all kinds of um, uh, regulations. So um, that we are very keen on uh, getting input on. Okay. Um, so let me just, we've got a couple of questions in the chat and I'll just read them out so that folks that watch the video later can hear it because they're not gonna see the chat uh, itself. But, so Tracy is asking, how is compliance evaluated? For example, would there be an I ISO audit of an organization by a third party where the QA must ultimately actively verify that the data has been forgotten? So this is a very interesting topic. Um, just to make sure that I'm not saying like a, a small disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer, right? So this is, I feel a bit of a question that is um, saying how exactly you, um, that, that is touching a little bit on the legalese. So from what I understood, there is currently no certification program for GDPR in a bit like an ISO audit process. So it's pretty much your own responsibility to be GDPR compliant. And there have been discussions about creating, let's say third party GDPR auditors. Unfortunately, um, the current consensus seems to be that even if there was such a process in place, it doesn't really prevent you. It's a bit like with the HIPAA discussion in the United States, even if you get GDPR compliant, assuming this existed, then it still doesn't prevent you from the liability in case you're doing something wrong when it comes to GDPR. So it's pretty much a bit like, well, um, if you get caught, you're going to be fined. And you know, there are people that have a hunger for just chasing down such companies and seeing if their data was, uh, was, was harvested or not. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that this is a pretty serious topic. And even if there is no proper audit for it, uh, it's pretty much your internal audit department should make sure that these things are, are taken seriously. Okay, cool. Uh, so there's another question here also from Tracy. Uh, under GDPR, there are provisions for grandfathering. Not Are there 
provisions for grandfathering non-compliant old solutions? If so, for how long? <laughs> yeah, so actually I have been uh, reading a bit on this and uh, according to the the EU's position is that they have been campaigning uh, for GDPR since 2016 and they, their position is that they have been informing the industry that GDPR is coming for two years before it started being officially enforceable in May 2018. So their position is pretty much like you, basically the second you're collecting personally, by, personally identified information, you have to abide to GDPR. There is no excuse for grandfathering or something like that. Now, of course, in practice, this is not quite how things have worked, right? So there, there have been very many companies that were criticized for lagging behind with GDPRs. We can also see the enforcement tracker that pretty much tells us a different story than what the expectations are. So I'm not really sure how to answer this question. No, GDPR per se does not allow you any provisions, but of course, de facto, it is known that certain companies are lagging behind. The European Union has sent a bit of a, of a message here that what they're looking for is not really perfection, but rather commitment. So they also accept the fact that, you know, how exactly to apply, to apply GDPR is a little bit of a, of a legal uncertainty and that they, um, that they do understand that the industry needs some time in order to figure all of these things out. But then again, they also want to see that you're taking these things seriously and you're not making um, dishonest mistakes, let's put it like that. Thank you for that. If anybody else has questions, uh, feel free to drop them into the chat here. Um, if I have a short question, perhaps. If, if you are currently running Kubernetes um, and you have, have engineers that are, are comfortable with, with that process, um, would they find it in any way challenging or unusual to, to implement the, the compliant Kubernetes distribution that you guys have come up with? Yeah, so we're actually running this already for some of our customers and we're having an on-call team that is also, yeah, they take all con rotations. So developers, uh, some of developers are also part of the on-call team. And uh, this is also part of the strength like of compliant Kubernetes that we actually know how to operate this. And we know it's not a very easy product to operate because it has just so many projects and so many topics that we try to cover at once. And it has so many moving parts. But then again, I think we also have learned quite a lot about the challenges of running such a complicated product uh, in production and also how to manage it for somebody else. So I think that we're also getting better and better like this in compliant Kubernetes with you know, making sure that we're announcing the breaking changes and what steps are needed for migrating from one version to another and making sure the migration can be done in a way that although it might take the control plane down, it doesn't affect the application or the logs and so on. So I, I hope that answers your question. John, was your question also, how, how does it differ from kind of vanilla Kubernetes, uh, compliant Kubernetes setup in general? Kind of things like not uh, being able to run containers as root and those kind of uh, those can, kind of uh, features. Mm. Okay. Can you elaborate on that, Christian? Yeah, so um, it's a little bit difficult to make an overall uh, comparison, but uh, like I said, we are the one of the few distributions that are open source, and also we're one of the few that are very laser focused on uh, compliance. So I would say that we are a lot more opinionated when it comes to topics that are covered with compliance. Other distributions are perhaps more opinionated when it comes to, for example, what base OS to use underneath or um, how exactly the compliant, the, sorry, the Kubernetes cluster should be configured. Of course, each vendor is trying to secure things in, in their own ways. These I would say are, are the two differentiators, open sourcing and opinionated towards compliance. Awesome, thank you. Um, Tracy has another question. Real liability to US companies serving Serving customers in, uh, sorry, <laughs> just jump. Real liability to U.S. companies serving customers in Europe. Um, current real-world examples, and I know you you had sort of the the, the really splashy ones like H and M and and Google and stuff. But um, do you maybe have some examples of of smaller shops that have gotten into 
GPDR hot water. Of uh, US companies in Europe, Robert, do you know any? <clears throat> I think the, the biggest one that made a head, headlines was probably Marriott, which I talked mm. about earlier. Um, they actually, uh, they bought a company uh, which didn't comply with GDPR and then they were massively fined uh, for that company's uh, failings pretty much. So uh, the story there is basically uh, you need to do very good due diligence with uh, regards to GDPR and kind of personal data management as well. Uh, because in the same way, you are responsible when you actually buy a company, you're responsible from day one for how they run their operations. Um, besides that, I, I would say that most of the companies, I mean, the big the big ones that are kind of in the headlines, of course, Facebook and, and the others, I mean, uh, they're very visible. Uh, but uh, when you talk about the smaller companies, I would say focus has primarily been kind of in Europe uh, by the European uh, DPAs, uh, the big American companies, the hyperscalers and, uh, and the Facebooks and the uh, others, I mean, they are in the headlines, but I would say uh, it's been kind of very quiet on the on the small company front in the US, so that should be, uh, I mean, with, uh, with everything else uh, being equal, it should be pretty safe at the moment. Yeah, I'll, I'll just, as, as a, maybe an aside is I know when GPR came on board a lot of um, businesses that rely on any sort of collection of, of emails for marketing purposes were really getting freaked out about what the implications might be and um, I have not heard of, of you know anybody in the EU going after folks that are running blogs and things like that though theoretically they are both liable <laughs> you know they're, they're probably doing it wrong and they probably have a liability risk but I'm, I'm sure right now the 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 effort is worth the EU going over after these really huge companies that have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people's data in, in their hands. Yeah. So um, just to reassure a little bit the people running blogs, um, I don't think that blogging per se collects personally identifiable information unless you're running some extremely weird analytics suit. But normally what is recommended is just make sure that your analytics suit is um, anonymizing the IP addresses because that's pretty much the most personal information you're, you're using. Try also not to use one of these hyper aggressive um, analytics tools that kind of trace you across websites and then leave cookies all over the place. And in that case, you should be pretty much safe. I mean, what do you really care as a blogger? You care about um, where, where is your audience, at what times of the days, what articles they are interested in. And maybe also in case they are commenting, that's usually done via a different platform. In that case, you can kind of argue that they give you an implicit consent to process, quote, their personal information since you ask them to type their username and pass, uh, sorry, their username and email address so you can get back to them. So I think the bloggers are pretty safe. After we have some, some providers that have a bit more serious functionality, they should definitely have a look at GDPR and look how that affects them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got a, thank you for that. Uh, we've got another question from Addy this time. Uh, folks like Azure are building stacks that can be deployed on hardware that isn't necessarily owned by Microsoft. Does that not still allow Azure-based Azure, Azure -based tech in the EU? Yeah, so definitely. Um, most of the people that wanted to keep data as much as possible in EU jurisdiction, they were pretty much building their cloud on top of uh, either OpenStack or VMware. And of course, one notice that although VMware as a software provider is American, if VMware is not operating your data center, then of course you can claim that, well, the whole operations is under EU jurisdiction and then you're not um, in any kind of trouble. That being said, I have heard that Microsoft is allowing you to kind of take their Azure software and run it on your own data center as if it was the official Microsoft Azure. I have yet to see anybody that actually does this. So I'm not really sure what are the barriers to this. Is it just cost or is it that it's very expensive to operate Azure in your own uh, data center? I'm, I'm not sure about this, but I haven't heard anybody actually running Azure Stacks in Europe. Okay, thank you. All right, folks, anyone else have a, a question? Again, just type it into the, the chat box and we'll, we'll get you an answer. And thank you, 
thank you both, by the way, for, for really awesome presentations. I thought they were really, you know, not only interesting, but very comprehensive. And I certainly learned a lot about G GDPR and, and uh, also the, the approach to Kubernetes you guys are taking, um, you know, really going all open source with all the pieces that are fitting in is, is really pretty cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And looking forward to uh, your contribution and also to learning how exactly the CCPA is different from the GDPR and how that has different implications on how a Kubernetes and cloud native stack needs to be configured. Okay. Well, I think it uh, looks like you've answered everybody's questions. So thank you again. Um, we, we are recording this folks. So uh, if you either showed up late or, um, you know, want to share this with, with your friends, you thought it was a, a worthy presentation, please do so. We will, uh, if you were registered, you will get an email directly from us. It will go up on our YouTube channel. I'll look for it in a, probably about two or three days once we have it all uh, tidied up and ready to go. Uh, and thank you again, Elastasis, for an awesome meetup.